Goeiedag en hartelijk welkom bij episode 110 van AgriMonitor. Ek is Elvira Hating en ouder gewoonte Keirik Dinsda saam met julle in hierdie program. Na die afgelopen woensdag was dan een werelddag vir water en dit is dan ook ons focus van hierdie AgriMonitor episode. Nou die afgelopen week het minister Kali Schleitwein in een hoofvlak afgevaardig is dan nou die waterconferentie van die Verenigde Nasies in New York, Amerika gaan bijwoon. Nou, meneer Kali Schleitwein gee een nies gesprek terugvoering oor die speciale aangeleendheid. Dan nou ook word uiterste soos droogtes, vloede en dan nou ook orkaan Freddy werkelijk dier klimaatsverandering veroorzaak. Prof. François Engelbrecht van die Universiteit van Witwatersrand het die afgelopen week in windhoek hier oor terugvoering gegeen. Nou ja, hy het gepraat tijdens Saskalse plaaslike bekendstelling van hulle tweede navorsingsprogram. Dit is dan nou een vijfjaar program en dit is dan nou die afgelopen week ook in windhoek gedoen. Dankie vir die saamkeier, bly ingeskakel. Funding facilities and the risk aspects that are related to the potato production is also fair. As we said at the beginning, the last water conference of the United Nations was 46 years ago. Now we have the second conference. And that was organized when it was realized that the water cycle is in crisis. The water crisis is at the same time linked to climate change and the crisis that is surrounding and coming upon us because of climate change. So one of the key issues that we had supposed, proposed to the conference is that the water agenda must be elevated to the same status as the climate change agenda so that they can be discussed in tandem. The one cannot be left behind, then we do only half a job. I believe we have achieved that. We have also realized that science is the basis to, on which we must take our decisions and that it must be much strengthened. Scientific research, scientific management of water resources and the alike must be accelerated so that decisions that we take at political level are well-founded in science. We have also, as a founder of the initiative, to employ an envoy, a special water envoy in the UN. The employment will be done by the Secretary General. We are taking great pleasure in seeing that that proposal is now receiving wide support and we can be optimistic that it will be decided is a institutional change through which the UN Water, the existing UN Water Bureau, will be servicing the envoy and we have proposed an elevation to membership based participation through a membership based task force and report backs by the envoy through the Secretary General to its members, that is the, the assembly. So we are very pleased that that institutional arrangement that will enable us now to give the status to water that it deserves will in fact come about. Thirdly, we will enjoy more frequent meetings. The next meeting that is now being scheduled is in 2026. That proposal needs to be officially carried and agreed upon, but we believe that it is widely supported. We believe that the categorization of countries in least developed, in middle developed and in developed countries is not helpful when we talk about equal 
ability to solve the water crisis. 75% of all poor people live in middle income countries and if we do not have the ability to source um, concessional and soft financial um, support to solve these problems, we run the risk that these people in middle income countries will be left out and we will miss the goal of inclusivity in water for all. We believe that that is taken note of and we um, understand that there is a discussion underway to review the architecture of the financing model that is pursued. So again, our uh, intervention appears to have been listened to. We, we have had a number of side events uh, through which we strengthened our cooperation with UNESCO, with the International Atomic Board, and they have all to do with the scientific basis on which we want to manage groundwater and surface water, and with which we want to improve our ability to have a system of knowledge-based decision-making in place. And lastly, we are very pleased that we could inform the um, conference that Namibia has approved the accession to the UNEC Convention on Transboundary Water Management. That was a key point that was raised by the conference that it needs political will to cooperate across borders because water, whether it is surface water, rivers and lakes, whether it is groundwater aquifers, the large ones, most of the time they are transboundary and they need to be managed in a cooperative fashion so that we do not um, see ourselves in situations where a winner takes all and the others are empty handed. We cannot afford that because of the simple fact that life is dependent on water. So is any social development, any economic development needs water and we cannot afford to be left behind or take all. I believe that that is more or less what the conference has achieved and what we have achieved, a very successful conference. Did you know you can buy a new or second-hand vehicle such as light delivery vans, trailers, small trucks and tractors for agricultural use? The repayment period for these vehicles ranges between 5 and 10 years. Contact your nearest Agribank branch or visit our website at www.agribank.com.na for more information about this loan product. You can also visit us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. Agribank, your all season back. Um, you certainly have this appreciation that never, never before have we needed the Southern African countries to stand together in terms of their climate and environmental science, and of course in terms of climate change adaptation, and of course in terms of making our fair contribution to mitigation. But let me, let me take us through these slides. I'll start by reflecting on some very recent and tragic events in our region. So, I think we are all aware of what happened in Madagascar, Mozambique and Malawi in the last two weeks. Um, in Malawi, um, I've, I've, I've checked the news uh, a few days ago, I've been in the Namib Desert with colleagues the last few days, but um, the last time I've checked, Tropical cyclone Freddy's landfall um, in Mozambique and then its eventual movement to southern Malawi. Um, the statistics now show that more than 300 people died in southern Malawi alone, most in the city of Blantyre. Um, it's an absolute tragic event. We, we've seen this before, but why, why I find it especially tragic? is because that of the fact that the weather forecasts issued 
for the track of this event and for its impact in terms of rainfall have been really accurate. Um, at least three days ahead of the system, moving in over Blantyre, we knew that the system was heading towards southern Malawi and Blantyre. And we've seen we've seen this time in time and again in the re time and again in the region. I'll show more examples now. The science is is already good. The science is strong in many cases. In this case, we did have early warning. But the early warnings that we issued, also by the Malawian Disaster Risk Reduction Agency and the Weather Service. Uh, which, which, which we've, with whom I've had some contact during this event, the warnings were accurate and were there. But our people in the region are so vulnerable that often they cannot make use of that knowledge. Um, so it is, it is not even about a lack of awareness. I think often the, re the warnings do reach people, but we should realize in Blanta, for example, what I've just now been reading, um, and in some correspondence with colleagues, the people, of course, live in informal housing like in many parts of the world. It was a region where there were mudslides following the heavy falls of rain. Many of the houses are built from mud and they collapsed. And you must have seen those pictures on television and the internet of people trying to save their loved ones. So the first message I want to convey today is as we embark on SASCAL 2.0, Let's take note of the fact that our science needs to be better than ever before. In many instances, our science is already good, sometimes good enough. In other cases that we'll discuss in this week, uh, in the coming week, in the coming few days, there's so much more we need to know about the future impacts of climate change and environmental change in our region. But what we also need to make sure of in SASCO 2.0 is that we make the right effort for our science to be transdisciplinary in the sense that it values knowledge forms outside our science so that our knowledge can find uptake in the most vulnerable communities. So the first message I want to share to summarize that is the uptake of our science needs to be just as important as the science we are going to generate in SASCO 2.0. And that's not easy. That is not easy um, for the science to manifest in, for example, long-term adaptation, because it's expensive, that adaptation. But we'll get to that. I do want to share two other important examples. Um, they convey the same message, but also another message that I would like to convey. This was tropical cyclone Idai. It made landfall on the 14th of March 2019 at Beira, almost exactly at midnight. That remains until today the worst flood disaster our region has ever experienced. So in that disaster, more than 1,300 people died. In Mozambique, and many in Beira, also people, in, also people that died in, uh, who died in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and um, early on in Madagascar. So, this, until this day, is the worst flood disaster in the history of Africa south of the equator. Once again, the track of the storm was forecast accurately. Three days ahead of landfall, we knew it was going to make landfall at Beira. So it's the same message from another storm system, but um, the other point I want to make is this storm had the category 4 hurricane status just before it made landfall at Beira. Now in Beira, um, studies have now shown that some people haven't evacuated because they thought that the storm would be like more recent cyclone and tropical layers that they have experience in living through. But in this case, the storm made landfall as cate in category three status at the moment of landfall, and it generated winds of more than 200 kilometers an hour. And um, 
That's unsurvivable. That's, of course, unsurvivable if you live in an informal house. And uh, that is the next important point. Um, our people are extremely vulnerable. In the developing countries, as we know, there's an immense, immense vulnerability. Um, let me make a third point. This is South Africa, um, 12th of April last year. That weather system that you can see there almost looks like a tropical cyclone, but it, it wasn't one. It was a cut of low pressure system that in some way, uh, in a way never seen before, changed its structure the moment it moved over the Indian Ocean and assumed the, some of the attributes of a tropical low pressure system. So the third point I'd like to make today is what is climate change doing in our region in terms of extreme events? That will, of course, be the main focus of my talk, um, making use of the IPCC findings of the last few years. So in Durban, um, just to remind everybody about what happened there, 544 people died in the end. This is the worst flood disaster in the history of South Africa. Um, and it was, it was very similar. Um, we, had, we had very of our, our cities is growing in an informal way. Um, Itakwini, the larger Durban area, is growing informally. And thousands, or actually just, uh, tens of thousands of people live along the big rivers in the Durban area, like the Umgeni, and the long steep hill slopes. And when the heavy falls of rain occur, once again, mudslides and um, flooding. And people, despite early warnings, that in this case could have been better, but despite those warnings that were eventually issued, people found themselves exactly where they always are the moment that the flood came through. So I think um, the third point, um, whether these events are caused by climate change, is, is something we really need to reflect about, also in SASCO 2.0. There is the president of my country, President Ramaphosa, on the 13th of April, the day after the floods, in the communities, uh, meeting people, uh, giving his condolences, and um, he also made some important statements. He said, this disaster is part of climate change. It is telling us that climate change is serious, it is here. That was his statement on the scene. So he actually made a so-called climate change attribution statement on the scene. So um, we as scientists, of course, have to check whether that type of statement is correct. And that is one of the important science aspects of science that is, that is now really growing in climate science, attribute whether an extreme event was caused by climate change or was it maybe made worse by climate change. Or is it just natural variability? So um, before I get into my, uh, my overview of the current state of knowledge in our region, let me just say one more thing. Um, in all these flood-affected countries of the, the last five years, stretching at least from heavy flooding as far west as Zambia, across Malawi, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, Madagascar. Um, in all these countries, we should acknowledge that these types of events maybe focus on these small screens. Well, that is flickering, but it's where I have that flickering. Um, in all these countries, flooding has been a natural part of life. It's part of natural variability. In the case of Durban, um, Durban is the, depicted there on the right hand side. There was a cut of low weather, cut, cut of low pressure system that caused the flood. But in, uh, as, as, as recently as April 2019, a very similar weather system killed about 80 people. And back in 1987, almost exactly the same weather system killed just more, just over 500 people. So, two messages um, in this regard. We should be prepared for a variety of extreme events in the region. We are not sufficiently prepared for weather systems that have been affecting us for the last 30, 40 years. So we are vulnerable this, without climate change. 
It's not the topic of my talk today, but I think it, it will soon be conclusively proven through peer-reviewed research that climate change did make the Durban flood event more intense. And I think if we look at the remarkable track of tropical cyclone Freddy in the Mozambique Channel, climate change attribution science will soon prove that climate change did make that system longer living than it was supposed to. So, with that bit of background... Van deze weekse veilings lijkt dan soos volg. Op 28 maart is Agra met de veiling op Okahanya, Karoe Oes met de veiling op Ochinene, die NLA met de groot en klein veiling op Monika en die WLA met de klein veiling op Reubot. Op 29 maart is Agra weer met veilings op Gobabes en Karasberg, Blauwberg met de veiling op Grootfontein, die NLA met de stoet en een commerciële veiling op Aranos en die WLA met een groot veiling op Hoogveld. Op 30 maart is Agra met veilings op Ochivarongo en Ketmanshoop, die NLA met die Conradi Genetics veiling op Gobabes bij die Sand Dune Lodge en die WLA met een groot veiling in Bintouk. Op 31 maart is Agra met de veiling op Otavi, Karoe Oes op Gobabes en die NLA met de groot en klein veiling op Marintal. Op 4 april is Agra met veilings op Namatubis en Reubot, Karoe Oes op Onderombapa en die NLA met de groot en klein veiling op Bloemvelde. Van deze weekse dagboek op 28 en 30 maart wordt inlichtingsdag oor haar levingslandbouw op Grootfontein en Ochiwarongu gehou. Nou op 28 maart wordt het eerste op Davi Kok se plaas Blijstroom en die Nurugas omgeving gehou en dan op 30 maart op Koos Bridenan se plaas Buffelhoek en die Ochiwarongu omgeving. Mensen waar het wil bijwoon moet dan bij de NLI registreer. Op 4 en 5 april wordt die Akkerbouw Producenten Vereniging se inlichtingsdag en jaarlijkse ledenvergadering dan nou ook na bij Grootfontein gehou op die plaas Venus van Klaas Malan. Nou die thema vir hierdie jaar is alternatieve gewassen met een speciale focus op sonneblomme in haar levensboerderij stelsel. Nou hiervoor moet daar ook bij de NLE geregistreerd worden. Ons kom dan nou bij van deze weekse vleesprijzen, nou verslachtingsprijzen, dan nou redelijk onveranderd, maar veilingprijzen waar dan nou op niet in die week van 27 maart baie gedaal het. Beeste se slagprijse by Metco en Windhoek, dan nou vir grade A, A, B en B, tussen 61 dollar en 62 dollar 50. By Diefkoor op Okahania is daar tussen 62 dollar en 64 dollar per kilogram betaal, terwijl Mietkou in die noordelijke communale gebied bij die selte grade tussen 30 dollar en 43 dollar 13 betaal het. C grade, Mietkou het in Windhoek 60 nummerpiese dollar per kilogram betaal, Biefkoor tussen 62 en 64 nummerpiese dollar. In die noordelijke communale gebied het Mietkou vir C grade tussen 28 dollar en 41 dollar 13 betaal. Veilingprijzen lijkt in die stadium glad niet goed nie. Um, Tol is die afgelopen week dan nou gemiddelde prijs van 29,9 cent per kilogram 
uh, behaal op veilingsverse 26 dollar 29 cent, stoer osse 26 dollar 77 cent, stoer verse 25 dollar 2 cent, slag osse 27 dollar 61, slag verse 25 dollar 2 cent, dan nou koeie maar tot vet tussen 18 dollar 74 en 27 dollar 72 per kilo, Slagbille dan nou 24 dollar 49 per kilogram um, koeie met kalwers dan nou gemiddelde prijs van 11.191 geslagskaap dan nou ook goedkoper um, vir dorpers is daar gemiddelde prijs van 30 dollar 8 cent per kilogram behal vetsterte 30 dollar 42 cent per kilogram um, bokkes prijs dan nou ook Um, afwaarts en vir die eerste keer onder 1000 Amerikaanse dollar per bok, dit het die afgelopen week dan op 943 Amerikaanse dollar per bok gemiddeld gestaan. Ons sê vir julle baie dankie vir die saamkeier, volgende week selfde plek, selfde tyd, maak ons weer so, tot ziens. Kletskompas is een Afrikaanse continuïteitsprogram met Namibische nies en onderhoude. Kletskompas streef om die hart van die Afrikaans sprekende gemeenskap te bereik. Nieuwe episodes van die program word elke weekdag op NTV, oneup2.com en op Republikeinse Facebook platform uitgesaai. Kletskompas focus op nieuws, onderhoude, leesersfotos en die sportbrand. Voor enige nieuwsverwante navra of advertentie benodigere, contact kletsatsynergy.com.na